the Caribbean Sea spreads across over one million square miles and contains over 7,000 islands, keys, and reefs. Though divided by language, distance, and governance, the Caribbean is connected by nature, the winds, currents, weather patterns, coral reefs, and the plants and animals that move from one part of the Caribbean to another all create a web of connectivity. Seabirds connect the air, land, and sea together. Nesting on land, feeding out at sea, they are some of the most aerial of birds, able to spend long periods far from land. Comprising about 290 species, seabirds are extremely adaptable, living in all areas of the globe and feeding in a great variety of ways. There are about 21 tropical species that breed in the Caribbean, including terns, frigate birds, tropic birds, shearwaters, boobies, pelicans, petrels, and gulls. Uniquely transboundaried, seabirds are constantly traveling through ecological systems and across political borders. This makes seabird conservation very difficult. 10,000 years ago, Puerto Rico, the United States Virgin Islands, and the British Virgin Islands, with the exception of St. Croix, were connected in a single landmass. And so because of that, uh, these islands share a lot of the same endemic species. And of course, today they're separated by political boundaries, but birds and fish, you know, they don't have passports, they don't have to check in with customs and immigration. So it makes conservation of these species an international issue. Dans un marin, ils vont euh, au-delà, enfin, ils, ils vont nicher un, un, dans un, un lieu précis. While seabirds will nest in a specific location, they do spend about 90% of their time at sea throughout the Caribbean. As such, the conservation of a species of seabirds is not linked to just one island, but to a group of islands, or the region. In that sense, it's interesting to look at possible collaboration, to share our ideas. In a place like the Caribbean, where you have so many countries, you have all of these political boundaries that these birds are crossing on a regular basis, not to mention the fact that during the non-breeding season, they may move into the Gulf of Mexico, they may move up to the northern coast of the U.S., and, and you might find them off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, or as far east as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. You have a bird like a, like a mass booby or a white-tailed tropic bird that can cross from one political boundary to another. They often do that on a weekly basis. For example, white-tailed tropic birds that nest in the Bahamas will leave the Bahamas and forage over Cuba, or even as far south as Jamaica, and then return to the Bahamas within a week. They're also crossing policy boundaries regularly. One country may have a more conservative approach to protecting birds, while another's may be less conservative. Is there a chance that they may end up in a country where that species is still harvested? When there's disasters that strike, that political transboundary nature comes in as well. About 100 birds were banded here before, about three or four years ago. And we sent the team out now to see how many birds that they can find with bands on and to get the band numbers and bring that back just so we'll have an idea of the return rate of the ones that were banded. And once we've done that, we're going to go out and band everybody who doesn't have a band already so that we can see what's happening with them. The objective is to, to have all the birds on this key marked and the young ones from each year will have a different color mark as well as an aluminium bag. So we'll be able to just look and see quite quickly like the age of the birds that are on the key. We'll know the age at first breeding. This year we put a black band on. So when we see a black banded bird, we'll know that, that's, that it's back and it's breeding in the colony. Next year we'll use another color so that we'll be able to um, identify each age cohort separately. So two young birds that were banded here this year have been recovered. One of them was found in Cuba and the other one was actually found in New Jersey. But it does suggest that young birds from this colony are moving away from the colony as soon as they can fly and be independent and I'm going much further than we actually expected. There's also an ecological side. Seabirds move from land to sea multiple times a day. They're crossing current fronts. They're moving from shallow waters to deeper waters. They're going to a local reef and fishing there. So when you combine these political boundaries and these ecological boundaries that seabirds cross, ultimately is that it means that conservation and management can be a lot more challenging.
because there's a lot of aspects that we have to consider. Multiple countries, multiple ecological zones that all need to be considered for this one or this small group of species. Seabirds are long-lived with delayed sexual maturation and low annual reproductive rates. Their chicks need high levels of care requiring body temperature regulation, feeding, and protection from predators. Seabirds are especially vulnerable to disruptions, whether in their food web or in their nesting areas. Seabirds work uh, as a very, very good indicators of the marine environment. They serve as indicators for climate change, for pollution, for fish availability, sometimes in the diet composition. For example, in a year, if there is a, a change in the amount of fish available, they will be the first ones to reflect it. They will bring this low quality food to the chicks and you will see chick deaths and maybe these fish just thrown beside the nest because they cannot eat it and digest it. Changes in the sea that reflects always in the in the amount and the proportion of food available and the the proportion of species so they will reflect this change in the in the way they feed the, the chicks and how they grow or if maybe they they just decide they, they are not going to breed in a specific year because there is no enough food most seabirds nest in colonies and many practice high nest fidelity which means they are likely to keep returning to their nest sites year after year. One of the things these birds need to be successful is stable nesting areas. Nesting areas that are going to be there next year, five years from now, and ten years from now. If this colony is disturbed, they can just go over to the next island or the next colony. And so what's the big deal? The big deal is that, well, for one thing, there's a lot less open land than there used to be. Isolated beaches and isolated islands are, are far less common than they used to be. But, but more importantly, and I think this is something a lot of people don't understand about seabirds, and, and actually a lot of birds are, are like this, is that their tie to a place is incredibly strong. So we call that fidelity. If a bird is hatched out at a colony, if this is where it was born, well, what's the likelihood it's going to come back here? In some studies that have been done, it's remarkable how many birds come back, not just to the same island, and not just to the same colony on that island, and not just to the same area in that colony, but within a few meters of the nest they were hatched from. If a mass booby is hatched here on Middle Key, the odds of it moving to Bird Key, not very high, even though Bird Key is only a few kilometers away. Well over 90% of the seabirds that, that breed at a colony this year will be back at the colony next year. And, as with natal fidelity, it's not just the same colony or the same area in the colony, it's the same nest. So, one thing you have to be really careful about when you're looking at seabird colonies is saying, oh, well, there's 100 birds out there, they must be doing fine. Those 100 birds will be willing to come back to this colony and be unsuccessful for a long number of years before they give up and go somewhere else. You really need to know what their breeding effort is, you need to know if the eggs are hatching, and ultimately, you need to know if those chicks are surviving. Because these birds are long-lived, they would be willing to forego one, two, three, five years of unsuccessful breeding for that one good year. But that one good year may not come along if the encroachment continues to get more intense. And that's one of the real challenges for seabird conservation, is maintaining the integrity of those colonies. Because Birds are going to be there a long time. Many of these colonies have been in use for hundreds of years, if not more. The Pedro Bank, Jamaica's most important commercial fishery, is also Jamaica's most diverse breeding site for a wide variety of seabirds. Southwest Key, known as Bird Key, provides essential habitat for thousands of terns, boobies, gulls, and magnificent frigate birds who depend on the key and surrounding waters. I'm very impressed with the Southwest Key, otherwise locally called Bird Key. I'm impressed with the number of birds that nest over there, number of bird colonies that exist on the key. And I think it should be a protected area. It was just really amazing and just thrilling to be on the island with so many different bird species and seeing all the bird chicks. I've never seen a brown booby before. I've never seen a mass booby before I came out here. Bird Key is, a, is an impressive sight coming from my own island. 
that's really impacted by um, the presence of uh, invasive feral goats and rats. It's nice to see a frigate bird colony that appears to be unimpacted by those invasive animals, so that was encouraging. Fishers who work on the bank observe the birds and often find them helpful with directional navigation and indications of weather. On a good calm day, you would see the bird maybe two miles up in the area. When you see it by the weather going get hard, then drop low to your feet. So you know say the breeze going to blow hard. If I go see nine o'clock in the morning, going down the sea and see the bird them coming up. I can't tell myself so I can't come back up because all the rain will fall. Because it looks look to me like the bird didn't feel the weather before we as a human. Even if we go 13 miles, we just go 7 because I know say we rain will fall. That is a sign the bird gives me. It is estimated that the Caribbean has only about 10% of the seabirds that it once hosted. With the continued development of coastal areas and isolated keys, seabirds are losing more and more habitat, and the Caribbean is considered a conservation hotspot, with 14 of the 21 species in the region of conservation concern. Between 1984 and 2001, there was a decline in the population from 5,000 to 3,000 nesting pairs. This population is relatively small. The fact that it is a population in decline also contributes to its fragility with regards to climate change. Since 1995, the population of Audubon shearwaters were exposed to rat predation. Exercises to eradicate the rat population, which as a predator presented a serious threat to reproduction of the shearwaters, was carried out by the management of the regional nature part of Martinique. This is how one risk factor was eliminated, and there is ongoing annual monitoring to make sure this problem does not resurface. After this, in order to properly understand the state of this population, the database gives us an idea of the adult lifespan, which is a useful indicator as it gives us an idea of whether we're dealing with a stable population or one in decline. We have an issue where our frigate birds are diving on fishing lures and they're becoming entangled in monofilament fishing line. And what happens is frigate birds don't have waterproofing on their wings. So they tend to dive sharply and they, they pick up the lure. And a lot of times because the fishermen might be fighting a school of fish, rather than take the time to untangle the hook bird, a lot of times what the fishermen will do, probably unaware that it's gonna cause any damage, they simply cut the line and let the bird fly back to the colony. And what's happening is we're seeing 40, 50, 60 dead birds a year on Great Tobago Island. On Bonaire, the main threats we have for seabirds, one of them is exotic species. We have donkeys, pigs, goats, feral dogs as well, and feral cats and rats roaming about these areas. In the case of the goats and the donkeys, trampling is a problem, hoofs. Uh, crashing eggs and you can see them just trampling the whole area. We also have uh, cats and rats eating chicks in, in these areas. We also have people walking their dogs on this area sometimes and disturbing all the nests. Flooding is also a big problem because in, in Bonaire some of these uh, species will be nesting at the bocas of the salt flats and if we get a lot of rain and the, the water level in the, in the salt pan raises too much, then it will uh, wash away all the eggs. But my guess is that we're going to have less than 30% nesting success on Bonaire. That's what I'll be trying to find out next year. And it's basically mainly to all these problems that I mentioned before, all these threats. In San Andres, like for example for the fragged birds, in Providence for fragged birds and so on, on shore water, they are in touristic areas. We have the challenge also to management these things and to protect the nesting habitats for them, no? We have recovering an area of mangrove in San Andres that are nesting now the, the frigate birds. The Pedro Bank has three small keys, once so thickly covered with seabirds that they were mined for guano and there was a brisk trade in seabird eggs between the bank and mainland Jamaica. Two of the keys are home to fishing communities whose structures and daily activities endanger natural habitats. Middle Key, only 10 acres in size, is home to over 400 residents during the peak fishing season. 
The key has serious sanitation and solid waste problems, and these not only affect the humans, but have life-threatening impacts on wildlife as well. The bird colony on Middle Key is mass boobies. That's one of the rarest seabirds in the Caribbean, and the Caribbean population may be genetically distinct from other populations around the world, so that's something we're looking at. This is one of the largest colonies in, in the Caribbean. There's probably six to eight known colonies. Eggs on Middle Key, about 38% produce chicks, whereas on Bird Key, 100% produce chicks. So there's a big differential in survival. The Nature Conservancy has been working with the Pedro Bank community to better manage their solid waste. In September 2012, the entire community came together and worked ceaselessly for days to clean up Middle Key. The immediate impact for community members has been heightened awareness, an improved aesthetic, and a better quality of life. There are important improvements for wildlife as well. Seabirds now have expanded nesting areas and a less toxic environment. They pretty much made a decision to, to, to clean up the key and to start doing different things as it relates to waste disposal. The Nature Conservancy provided about 10 incinerators that are distributed all over the key and they're being used to burn combustible waste and to reduce the amount of garbage that, that makes it to the dump. So it's, it's really a community effort, something that they're very, very happy for. And apparently the, the birds that we're trying to protect, they're happy as well, because since that cleanup effort, we're seeing more birds, we're seeing birds migrate to areas and, and go to areas that they weren't previously nesting and, and roosting. So we're just hoping that more birds will fly over Middle Key, look down, see a colony of, 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 of moss boobies and decide that, hey, they want to stay here. And, and those that were born here, you know, would fly away and, and after a couple of years when they're ready to breed, they would come back here. The Nature Conservancy also implemented a successful removal of cats from the key. This has allowed the majority of chicks to grow to maturation for the first time since the cats were introduced by residents. It's really nice to have a success story. I've been coming here from since about 1984. And when I first came here, there were people um, and there were nesting birds and they seemed to be quite successful. Five to 10 years ago, the, it seems that cats were introduced and from that point, the nesting success of the birds on this key started to decline to the point that uh, about this time last year we were actually seeing no surviving chicks. As a result of that TNC got the JSPCA to come and start removing cats and this has it resulted in a huge increase in the nesting success of the mass boobies on this key. When the sun is going down we're not hearing the screams from the mass booby colony because cats are, are going through and trying to get their chicks. Um, that's, that's very encouraging. Just, just to hear the, the silence at night coming from the colony because they're not being harassed by cats, it makes me feel good. It makes me feel warm inside. The Caribbean is very much underrepresented in both seabird research and conservation. To address this deficit, the Society for the Study of Caribbean Birds, Clemson University, and Defenders of Wildlife have sponsored a series of capacity-building workshops. The Nature Conservancy hosted two of these on the Pedro Keys, which gave participants from across the Caribbean valuable hands-on experience while gathering basic survey and monitoring data necessary for seabird conservation. We did bird censuses over by Bird Key and that was a totally new experience for me assessing birds so that was a, a great way for me to learn how to do that. This experience has actually broadened my vision or my, my scope in terms of what is out there. It just opened the avenue for, for studying birds and possibilities that have come to mind about the, the bird colonies that are around Port Royal, around the, the Kingston Harbour region. It's, it's not necessarily for me to study, but to motivate a, a young and upcoming scientist to go and study that and even provide some basic help to them. I thought that was one of the main things I could come away from this workshop with. We came back to Pedro. We're doing another training workshop. As part of the training workshop, we were also doing some deployment of some tracking devices. We deployed three satellite tags 
on adult mass boobies over at Bird Key, and we deployed two satellite tags on adult mass boobies here at Middle Key. All of those birds were raising chicks. We also deployed and recovered approximately 10 or 12 GPS tags, which are short-term tracking devices that we use to get uh, highly accurate locations on foraging tracks throughout the course of the week. And then today, we put out 18 geolocators, which will be long-term tracking devices that will hopefully stay on for about a year and give us an idea of a big picture sense of where these mass boobies might be traveling, not only during incubation and chick rearing, but also when those seasons are over. C'est une opportunité à ce moment-là de, de créer des contacts et. Um... I came to this workshop for the exchanges with other specialists in my field of seabirds. It's an opportunity to make contacts and see how we can better align our field work and conservation measures in the future. Of course, at the biological level, there's not much we can do. Nonetheless, we can sensitize our authorities and general public, and see how we can work together in an organized manner. I was a little bit out of date, so these workshops came right on time and it was a great network. In the capacity building, well, I learned a lot about the latest things on uh, designing surveys and how to approach different species for different studies and what to do and what not. And of course, try to do it all at the same uh, time and in a coordinated way for methodology, etc. throughout the whole Caribbean. It's a great thing because then we can get a lot more out of all the data we collect on the, in the field, you know, that we all can work together. It's very nice. A lot of times in the Caribbean, you know, we get very stuck in our own corners of the world and we're very insular. I mean, it's an insular region. We know what's going on in our island or maybe the next few islands over. But a lot of times there's a lot of good information out there and it's just even a matter of what equipment do you need? What's worked for one place? You're buying a piece of equipment but you don't have air conditioning. How is that going to impact the equipment where that's a concern that maybe in North America or the United Kingdom or Europe they don't really have? And they have similar problems and more experience in some things. So you can discuss and they can help and give you ideas. Maybe if you band a bird here, it's, it's easier if, if you know the person that is doing the, the research in your species in another place because you know she or he can look at the bird and tell you right away. I don't know, it's the sharing of problems and the sharing of solutions as well. Seabirds spend most of their lives out at sea, far from human observation. Seabird conservation is therefore very challenging, especially in the Caribbean, given the relative lack of research and the large number of separate political entities throughout the region. Caribbean seabird conservation needs include accurate surveys of which birds are where and in what condition, long-term monitoring regimes, the development of sustainable management plans that include protected areas, environmental education and outreach, and strong environmental policies, implementation and enforcement. I'm uh, aiming to cover the entire island where uh, nesting occurs and visit every nesting area at least once a week. And I would love at the end of this project to come up with solutions, like uh, at this time of the year, for example, we can close some roads so people don't have access to certain nesting areas or we can start a feral cat trap uh, system if that turns out to be the biggest problem. We might fence some of the areas uh, for uh, goats and donkeys and we can also raise some of the areas where they nest so in, in case the water level goes too high it doesn't affect the eggs. One of the reasons that I'm here is recently National Parks Trust expressed some interest in the possibility of satellite tagging um, magnificent frigate birds. Before we actually work on the outreach, how can science and how can this technology help us make a more informed decision? We can analyze the hooks in the colony and say what types of fishing practices make these birds particularly vulnerable, but also um, where exactly are they going? And maybe we can be a little bit smarter in planning our public education. We are geographic situated very near Jamaica. The archipelago have an area that is sharing with Jamaica that is Alice Shoal, New Bank, and Serranilla. There is part also from the archipelago, but also uh, is part of Jamaica. 
Our seabirds are very similar to the seabirds in Jamaica. We are very near, so we are interested to know how is the movement of our population of birds between two countries and also these are transboundary, it could be the connectivity of this population, I don't know. We can be sharing <laughs> some of the birds between Jamaica and also and San Andres, so in that case it could be an opportunity if we write together a proposal and we obtain some funds and we can join the efforts between the two, the two islands, no? Seabirds have been in the Caribbean long before human inhabitation and have their own intrinsic worth. They are also invaluable to humans as indicators of ecological conditions, such as climate change, the status of fish stocks, and the presence of environmental toxins. And since the earliest times, humans have been inspired by seabirds. They have helped humans navigate and survive and are cultural symbols of freedom and connectivity. In the splintered Caribbean, seabirds connect us. We need to work together across political, geographic and language divisions to protect these birds who know no boundaries.